Good morning, everyone. My name is Jared Tippetts. I am the Vice President for Student Affairs here at Southern Utah University, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's guest. Today, we'll have the wonderful opportunity of hearing from Alex Stone, who is the author of Fooling Houdini, Magicians, Mentalists, Math Geeks, and the Hidden Powers of the Mind. Alex has written for Harper's, Discover, Science, and several other magazines. He is a graduate of Harvard University and has a master's degree in physics from Columbia University. He grew up in Wisconsin, in Texas, and Spain, but is a current resident of New York City. So Alex became interested in magic at the age of five. In fact, his first gig as a magician was his own birthday party, and by his own admission, it didn't go so well. But he didn't give up. In his work, he asks some really interesting questions. Things like, how does magic fool us? How much of what we actually perceive is real? How much faith can we have in our own memories? How does science play out in magic? How does math play out in magic? How does studying cards help us understand ran randomness and entropy? How does magic help us understand the psychological concept of inattentional blindness? And how does magic transcend age and culture? Alex has said, behind almost all magic tricks, there's some psychological or scientific principle at work. And by looking into this, we can learn a lot about our own brain and human nature. Today we'll hear how the underground world of magic ties to psychology, to neuroscience, to physics, mathematics, and a number of other academic disciplines which all bring us together, brings us all together in this wonderful university community. When we conclude today's event, there will be books for sale out here in the lobby. And so please join me in welcoming to the stage, Alex Stone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Guys, I think there's been a bit of a mistake. I'm actually Chuck Aaron, the aerialist. No, I'm just. <laughs> that, that was pretty much my entire talk, actually. So I don't really have much to add to that. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. I really want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Southern Utah University. I want to thank Apex. I want to thank Lynn uh, for having me here. It's very kind of you, and thanks for coming. Um, but before we go any further, I, I need to, to handle some important business. And this is a, this is a very ap appropriate kind of Harry Potter-like hall for this. But I need everyone to raise their right hand and, and, and uh, allow me to lead you in the following oath. Because... After today, you're all magicians. And as we know, magicians have to follow an important oath, right? What's that oath? Well, we can't reveal the secret. So I want everyone to say, I, I. say your name, <laughs> promise never to, divulge never to divulge the secrets of magic. All right, great. Thank you. Give, your all, give yourselves a round of applause. Now with that, I am going to divulge one of the secrets of magic. I'm going to do a trick, and I'm going to show you how it's done. Now, I know you're not supposed to do this, but I'm doing this because I think that in many cases, the secrets to the tricks are as interesting as the tricks themselves, because they tell us something about how our minds work. Uh, magicians, however, do take the oath thing pretty seriously. Uh, I got in some pretty deep trouble a while ago for telling secrets, and I was excommunicated from one of my local magic societies as a result. How many people have seen that show, Arrested Development? Job? Yeah, that's, that's real. <laughs> so I'm going to do a trick, and then I'm going to show you how it's done. OK, everybody watch. I have a silver dollar here. Can everyone see? I'm going to place the silver dollar in my hand, and I'm going to make it very, 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 very small. Your stunned silence is worth more to me than a 1,000 standing ovations. Where is it? It's not here. It's not here. I just make a wave over my hand like that, and there it is again. All right? OK. <laughs> How did I do that? It's not that complicated. I'll do it one more time. Just watch. I put the coin in my hand. I make it disappear. Anybody know where the coin might be? Sleeve. No, actually. It's in my other hand. I palmed it, OK? I take the coin, I pretend to put it in this hand. There's a couple ways you can do it. You can do it like this, 
or you can do it like this, or you can do it like this. And then I just palm it in my hand, and I'm holding it here between these muscles, called classic palm. Now, that's interesting in a kind of physical way, but what actually sells the trick, what makes it work is that the brain still sees the coin in my hand a split second after the hands have parted. Watch closely. Do you see that? Neuroscientists call this a positive afterimage. It's literally the neurons in the brain still firing over the image of the coin after the coin is no longer in view. Magicians have a kind of cooler term for it. They call it getting a good burn. I like that a lot better. So why am I telling you this? Well, because even after you know how the trick is done, it still kind of fools you, right? Watch. Ah, wouldn't you just swear that it's in there? Watch one more time. Now, of course, the brain is all electrical impulses, axons and dendrites, and those create electrical impulses which can generate magnetic fields. So I can actually cause an anti-magnetic pulse. It's just science. <laughs> Thank you. So I became interested in magic as a kid. Um, my first gig was my own sixth birthday. I was heckled. It went very badly. Uh, but I kept it up, large part because my dad was really into it, and I liked to fool him. He was a scientist, and I, it was always kind of interesting to me because he never wanted to know how the tricks were done, even though he was this person who pursued you know, truth and experiment his whole life. But the real embarrass embarrassing fact is that I got more into magic as an adult. When I moved to New York and I discovered this whole subculture of magicians, mentalists, people who were inventing new tricks, they had these societies. They even had tournaments. There's even a Magic Olympics. Anyone heard of that? It's, um, it's every three years in a different city. Uh, and it's just like the regular Olympics, but with magic. Um, and you do a routine in front, of a, a crowd of, in front of a crowd, but also in front of a group of judges. And there's different categories. And then the judges literally give you like ratings, like as if it were figure skating or something, on technique and artistic ability and how badly you fool them. Um, and in 2006, I entered the Magic Olympics in Stockholm, Sweden, not really knowing the caliber of performer that competed there. In fact, people work for years and years and years on one five to ten minute routine. People come from schools, they bring their coaches, it's, it's pretty serious. And I did a little routine that I'd put together in the month before, not expecting just how hard it would be. Well, they have this rule at the Magic Olympics that says if you suck so bad that within the first two minutes you don't meet the minimum skill level everyone should have if they're competing there, the judges illuminate a red light of shame and you have to get off stage right away. So in 2006, that happened to one performer. Yes, that's right. That's right. Anyway, it's fine. Uh, after many years of uh, therapy, and uh, I, I finally came to peace with it. Uh, I, I was humiliated in front of many people, uh, thousands of people, many of them children. Um, but after that, I decided I really wanted to get to learn about magic, get better at it, understand it, the history, the science, the psychology. And that's what led me on this sort of quest that I ultimately wrote about in my book. And this quest taught me a lot of things. It taught me that the world of magic is incredibly colorful, filled with eccentric and brilliant characters. It taught me that magic is more than just a handful of dumb tricks that you might have seen a thousand times. It's in fact a very vibrant world filled with discovery and innovation. And most of all, it taught me that there's these intimate connections between magic and science. Magic has this way of revealing these little wormholes in our brain that make us human. And as a result, it tells us a lot about how our minds work and why sometimes they don't. Right? Why we miss things that are very obvious. Why we believe things that are false. Why we want to be fooled. Why we like fooling others. What the power and effects of secrecy are. What I also learned is that a lot of the literature in psychology and cognitive science is really just magic tricks being performed in a lab. I, for instance, did an experiment with one of the psychologists who first coined the term inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness is how many people have heard of this gorilla experiment? Raise your hand. Okay, for, for those of you who haven't seen it or heard of it, it's this pretty famous experiment where they had people watch um, 
a group of, uh, of experimenters or researchers passing a basketball around. And they said, count how many times the, I think there were two teams dressed in different colors, count how many teams, like the white team passes the ball. And then there was, um, you know, 30 seconds elapsed while people watched this video. And what they were told is that in the middle of the video, a man in a gorilla suit comes out and waves at the audience and then walks across stage, right in the front. And the incredible result of this experiment, which was done by Daniel Simon and Christopher Chabri, uh, is that most people don't see the gorilla. Well, that's not really true. It's not that they don't see the gorilla, because they are, in fact, looking right at it. They've done eye-tracking experiments that show that their eyes are looking directly at the gorilla when they don't see the gorilla. It's that something is going on in the brain that doesn't process the image of the gorilla. Just like the brain is processing the image of the coin a second after it's not there, the brain is creating an illusion, in this case, a kind of blindness, where it's not seeing something that's right in front of your face because you're misdirected. Now, how many people have heard that term misdirection in terms of magic, right? You probably heard the term, the hand is quicker than the eye, right? Yeah, that's a not entirely untrue term because I think a lot of us associate magic with, with you know, doing something here when in fact you're doing something secret over, over here, and that's certainly a part of it. But it's really more like the hand is quicker than the brain. Because it's not often, or not always, the eye that's being fooled, right? With the coin trick, for instance, it's not your eye that's at fault. It's not the eye that's fooling you. It's your brain that's fooling you. There's a saying in magic that says, the magician does the trick not in the hands or in their own hands, but in the mind of the spectator. It takes place in your mind. And it's your brain that fools you. In the case of the gorilla experiment, this is an ex example of what's known as inattentional blindness. It's a cognitive illusion whereby we are literally blind to things that happen right in front of our faces when we're distracted, right? When we're trying to multitask, when we're trying to do one thing, right, while paying attention to another. This has really important real-world implications. For instance, it's why you shouldn't talk on a phone while you're driving. A lot of people think it's the manual task of holding a phone in your hand while you're trying to operate a vehicle. And that's certainly part of it. But the main part of it is that holding on a conversation with someone, listening to what they're saying, talking back, answering questions, is a fairly demand demanding task cognitively. And it can actually make you temporarily blind to things that are right in front of your face, a biker or a car, and you're crossing over into your lane. And that can lower your reaction time and make you even uh, more likely to have an accident. This is also why hands-free devices aren't necessarily making you safer. Now, the experimental evidence isn't 100% on this, but the idea, again, is that it's not your hands, but your mind that's at fault. And magic has a way of hacking these little wormholes. The gorilla experiment being a kind of experiment in fooling people for science. And that's what I really loved about magic, is that insofar as psychology is a lot of magic being done in a lab, magic is a kind of applied psychology. I did an experiment with the woman who coined the term inattentional blindness, this woman, Arian Mack, and Irvin Rock was her, her colleague, and, and they're the ones who really did the early experiment in, in this work. How many people here have heard of this concept? Any psychology students here? No, okay. So, okay, a couple, yeah. So we did an experiment where we brought people into their lab, and under distraction, we stole their watches, all right? Now, I learned to steal watches from a magician at my local magic store. His name's actually Magic, uh, with a K. Uh, he's a cool guy. He rides a Harley. Um, he taught me how to do it, and he's really good at it. There are magicians who specialize in this. There are theatrical pickpockets who I swear can steal anything off a person, glasses, ties, a belt, all with, while distracting them. They'll even take stuff off a person and then put them in another person's pocket and do all kinds of crazy things. Um, I can steal watches. I'm OK at it. I'm not great. I practice on the New York subway. And um, we did this trick, this experiment. We brought people in. We stole their watches. I usually put it on my own wrist and then ask them what the time was. Ha, ha, ha. Really funny. Uh, and then, you know, we'd give them five bucks. And then we, you know, we were, how many people could we do this to? And it turns out that, much like the grill experiment, the vast majority of people didn't notice when we stole their watches right off their wrists. Now, I know you think that's something that, ah, oh, you definitely, you would definitely notice that, right? But the truth is, we often overestimate how much we notice. And the reason is because we're not aware of the things we're not aware of, right? So we overestimate our powers of observation, right? How keenly we perceive things. And as a result, we have a very 
overinflated sense of our own powers of control, our own powers of perception. And magicians exploit this all the time. Another very sort of famous example of this kind of cognitive illusion, and when I say cognitive illusion, I mean in distinction with an optical illusion, which is like something that fools the eye. A cognitive illusion is illusion not of the eye, but of the mind. Uh, another famous example of this is something known as change blindness. Change blindness is our failure to recognize changes in cons consecutive scenes. For instance, if I were to take my ring off, it might be easier to see it on the screen, I don't know, but can you see if I take my ring off like this, I can just put it on really quickly. Did everyone see that? Thank you. I don't know if you can see this, but I can put it in my hand like this and then throw it back on like this. Yeah, wow, she said wow, see, she likes this, you, you're my favorite. Oh, you said wow, okay, you're my favorite. So this is an example of change blindness. I'm actually doing a little trick with my fingers. You're looking at one finger, you think it's another. I'll show you another cool example using a deck of cards. Um, and this is a trick that you can do at home. You can fool your family and friends with this. And, and who doesn't want to do that, right? Uh, I have here the eight and nine. Can everyone see two black cards, eight and nine? And I put them right in the middle of the deck. Everyone see? Right in the middle. So far, so good? How many people here have seen the movie Pretty Woman? You know, that is nice to see that many hands still go up. <laughs> it's nice to see that in this new age of information and Instagram, certain priesthoods still remain. <laughs> uh, Pretty Woman, there's a scene in the morning after Vivian and Richard Gere have slept together where she's, uh, I know her name, Vivian, yes. Uh, she's eating a pancake. You remember this? And then the camera cuts away and cuts back and the pancake has turned into a croissant. Uh, then the camera cuts away again, cuts back, and it's a pancake again. So this is something called a continuity error. It happens in movies all the time. And it's not a flaw of the film. In fact, most movies are filled with them. Uh, Pretty Woman has several. The Godfather has a bunch. How many people have seen The Godfather? Remember that scene where Sonny gets killed at the toll booth, the machine gun? You watch that very closely, seconds after he's been shot, the windshield in the car is back to normal. It's restored. Just a blatant error. How many people actually notice that? Almost no one. Star Wars has like 50. Um, it, movies are filled with them because of the way movies are made, right? They're spliced together. There are multiple shots. And there are people like script corners who look, look for this kind of thing and try to minimize it. But the vast majority of people who are watching movies don't notice them because we're not paying attention to that. We're watching the film. And it turns out we're actually really, really, really bad at noticing even pretty stark changes from one scene to the next. Now, I put the eight and the nine in here. All I do is I snap my fingers and they come back to the top. Thank you. Does anyone know what I did? Well, I distracted you, yes. I definitely distracted you with that whole pretty woman story. Uh, <laughs> That's what I call it. It's my pretty woman story. Um, we all have one. Uh, I distracted you. That's called time misdirection because I want a little time to go by. But what I actually did, does anyone else have another idea? Yeah. Oh, thank you. What's your name? Mac. Mac? Mac. Everyone tell Mac he's great. That's right. It was a different eight and nine. First, I showed you the eight of clubs and the nine of spades. And then on the top, all the time, I had the eight of spades and the nine of clubs. Now, that's a pretty subtle difference. And with time misdirection thrown in, 99% of people aren't going to notice. Now, I recommend doing this trick, though. You can get free beers and stuff from that. You guys are college students, though, right? So no, just free Sprite. <laughs> But it turns out that we're so bad at noticing changes from events that you can, you can actually do incredibly drastic things and people still won't notice. Probably the most famous example of this, or the most sort of um, incredible example of this, was also done by the Gorilla Guys, Daniel Simon and Christopher Chabry. What they did was they had an experimenter stop a random pedestrian on the street and ask for directions. All right? And in the middle of asking for directions while the person was telling them, you know, here's how you get to 7-Eleven or whatever. They had some co-conspirators temporarily walk between them with like a door, an obstruction. And in that moment, 
where the door was between the pedestrian and the researcher who was asking questions, he switched with someone else. So that moments later, the pedestrian was talking to a completely different person. And guess what? Most of the time, they had no idea. So this is a very drastic but very real example of what's known as change blindness, our inability to notice changes from one scene to the next. And again, it has massive implications because when we're distracted, we fail to see things that are very, very obvious. And this has been done time and again in the lab, but it also has implications for everything from our legal system, where they've done experiments that have shown how unreliable eyewitness testimony is, that we might not notice a car changing color from red to blue that might have been at a crime scene, or, or a uh, the color of a person testifying, or a, a person uh, who's, held, uh, who's held accountable to, even now in the age of DNA evidence, eyewitness testimony still accounts for the vast majority of convictions. But in, in some cases, it's been estimated that 80 to 90% of it is unreliable. And that's because people really have trouble, especially when they're distracted and under stress, remembering things and, and, and noticing changes. They've also found that juries tend to pass harsher verdicts and have a harder time telling true statements from false statements when they're distracted. Misdirection plays a fundamental part in our lives. We're actually very, very bad at multitasking, even though we love to multitask because we think we're getting so much more done. But the truth is, we're not that good at paying attention to more than one thing at a time. I think it's really funny that in our day and age, we tend to diagnose kids with ADHD, right? The, the typical statement is that kids don't pay attention, right? But that's kind of a misnomer. Uh, the, the brilliant psychologist Alison Gopnik wrote this book called The Philosophical Baby, in which she raises a very important point, and that's that when we say kids aren't good at paying attention, we really mean the opposite, right? We really mean that kids are really good at paying attention at lots of different things at the same time. When we say that adults are good at paying attention, what we really mean is adults are really good at paying attention at one thing while ignoring everything else, right? That's the nature of paying attention. That's a signal virtue of the human brain, our ability to focus on a lone task while ignoring peripheral distractions. It's also, however, what lends us susceptible to misdirection and to these cognitive illusions, is that when you're really focused on one thing, you tend to ignore stuff that's happening around you. You tend to ignore stuff, even if it's happening right in front of you, if it's not the thing that you're focused on. And that's the thing that magicians exploit, and it's the thing that psychologists also investigate to help us understand how we see the world. I also think this is why kids, somewhat ironically, tend to be harder to fool than grown-ups. I found this time and again, and if you ask magicians, they'll tell you the same thing. I fooled Nobel Prize winners with pretty stupid tricks. But a pack of nine-year-old girls will shred my A material and make me cry. Now, there may be a prosaic reason for this. Kids are shorter, so they do kind of like see th certain things. But I don't think it's that. I think it's that kids are really good at focusing on a lot of different things at once, and it's much harder to misdirect them. They also don't have this whole ironwork of assumptions that as adults we carry with us all the time to establish and interpret and evaluate patterns and make decisions based on prior information. This is really important stuff. This is what helps us get our, our day together. It's what makes us not waste time and having to reevaluate everything. But it's also what kind of gets us in trouble when people try to fool us. This has implications for our decisions in day-to-day -day life. And I want to talk to you about decisions because ultimately, we think of ourselves as free actors making choices. But choices are something that we are often blind to as well. So for this, I need a few volunteers. Uh, Four volunteers. Who, who wants to come up here real quick and help me out with this? Yeah, why don't you come up? You, you, you three? Okay. And, and I need one more person. You, you please come. Come, sir. Yeah, come up, guys. Everyone, give them a, hand of, uh, give them a round of applause. Oh, uh, we got an extra. You guys can be together. It's fine. Come on. You guys have to play. The, you get, you get, I have four, five envelopes. All right. What, what are your names? Austin. Austin? Alyssa? Alyssa? Christiana? Christiana? Hunter? Fatalame. All right, everyone, give them a hand. Thank you. Now, we all like to think we're the author of our own decisions, right? And so we're going to play a little game here. It's a little bit like that Let's Make a Deal Monty game. You remember that? Maybe not. That's okay. I have five envelopes. They're each numbered one, two, three, 
four, five. Inside one of these envelopes, here, can you guys stand a little farther up so everyone can see you? Okay, wonderful. Inside one of these envelopes is a $100 bill. If you pick the envelope with the $100 bill, you get to keep it. You guys are going to have to split it because you're actually, <laughs> you guys are too. Does that sound fair? Now, you're going to have a free choice. I'm not going to influence you at all. But I am going to say one thing before we start. And that's, I've done this 10 times in the last month. And every time I've done it, it's always been in number two. Just saying. All right. Which one do you want? Two. <laughs> Wait. All right. I'll just hold on to that for now. All right, what about you? Which one do you want? Four. Four. All right. <laughs> what about you? Uh, three. Three, all right. Don't, no, don't open it up yet. We'll spoil the surprise. And what about you two, team? Can we see both of them? Like, they want to see both of them. <laughs> okay. They're taking five. All right, now you have number two. Now you seem pretty happy about that. Do you want to switch? No. <laughs> Even after everything I've told you, you still want to keep number two. All right, well, everyone who has three, four, and five, please open their envelopes and remove the contents and show them to the rest of the room. Oh, what's that? Blank paper? Oh, that is so sad. That's not a $100 bill. That's just newspaper. Oh, well, thank you for playing. <laughs> yeah, I just cut that from the newspaper. Now, wait. Do you want to switch? No. All right. I'm going to open mine first, if that's okay. Yeah. It's deal or no deal. That's what it is. That's what I meant. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, geez. I am going to take myself out to Sizzler later. <laughs> I, they don't have Sizzler in New York. They have Sizzler here. All you can eat tacos, steak, ice cream, yogurt. I open your envelope, though, because it, it, I, know, I know you notice that there's something thick in there, right? It's not, it's, there's not nothing in there, yeah? What is that? Except for the... Yeah, four gift certificates to Walgreens. Now, only one of them actually has money on it. You can keep one, and you have to give the other three away. I'm just kidding. They all have money on them. But here, you guys Thank can take you. it. You guys are going to have to split it. That's two fifty each. Guys, give everyone a round of applause. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's a me yeah. You can keep the envelopes, too. <laughs> and you wonder why people hate magicians. There's a, a whole literature in psychology and in magic on influencing people's decision, people's choices, that I find very fascinating. Uh, this is a, a magical experiment where it seemed perfectly fair, right? Everyone had their choice. I gave you many chances to switch. Uh, but it turns out that we're very bad at evaluating the impact of our own choices and also how much free will we really have on making them. Uh, in a classic series of studies, they brought shoppers into a supermarket and they gave them a choice of jam, like jelly or jam. And they had them try a, a couple different types and then they said, which one's your favorite? And then they gave them the one that supposedly they said was their favorite. And then they were like, you know, here you go, and had them taste it again. And, and weirdly, most people didn't notice that they switched the jams, so that they were actually, the one they picked wasn't the one they got. Um, and for some reason, there's a lot of jam studies. I think a lot of psychology is funded by big jam. Um, but then the, the coolest one I liked, uh, the one I liked the most is this one where they had people come into a lab and they showed them photographs. And they said, you know, which one do you like more? Which one do you think is more attractive? And they'd say, okay, this one. And then they would supposedly give them that one, but what they actually did was execute a switch. And curiously enough, these fancy scientists, the trick that they used was actually invented by an Austrian magician by the name of Hofzinger back in the 19th century. I mean, it was an actual magic trick. And then they gave them the photograph that they purportedly picked, but actually they switched them. 
So not only did they not notice the switch, and that's sort of change blindness, but when asked to justify their choice, they concocted these really sophisticated post hoc, post -hoc reasons. Oh, I like their eyes. Oh, I like their shape of their chin. I just think they're more attractive because they have a nicer tone of skin or whatever. And that's incredible to me that these people didn't, A, notice that the, the picture that they'd picked was switched with another one, but then afterwards they justified it to overinflate their own powers of choice and decision making. And it turns out that this has all kinds of problems when it comes to, say, picking retirement plans. They found that if you get too many choices in retirement plans, you're less likely to invest, right? Or that um, we experience decision fatigue when we have, and, and, and also uh, in, in, in like prices, for example. Like they've done ex these crazy experiments where they found that, you know, if you, tr tr you know, have to choose between like an expensive item and a less expensive item, you'll usually choose a less expensive item. But then if you throw in a third choice that's the same price as the expensive item, but actually includes like an extra thing that doesn't even matter or one less thing, then you'll pick the most expensive item. You know, little things like that. So magicians, there's a whole literature on how to influence people's decisions, how to manufacture what looks like a free choice when in fact maybe you're not allowing them to make a free choice or you're making them think that they have more uh, volition in what they're doing. But again, this, this comes into the psychology of why we do things and how we look at them afterwards and think and interpret them and tell a story, a narrative of our own lives. Now, it starts to sound a little creepy, right? Um, my wife is always saying, magic is creepy enough, you don't need to help it out at all. Um, but there's a reason for that, and that's because a lot of these tools can be used to study the human mind and to entertain people, but they can also be used to rip people off. And a lot of the techniques that magic uses come from the underworld, the criminal underworld, some of the best magicians in the world trained with the card sharks and the hustlers. And some of them have used these techniques to rip people off and to make money doing cons. How many people have heard of like the three card Monty or the shell game? Okay, yeah, fair enough. Um, you don't see it that much anymore. You still see it sometimes in New York. About five to 10 years ago, you would still see it quite a bit. I'm gonna show you a little example of what it looks like, but uh, it uses three cards. Usually it uses three like low cards, like a two or a three, and then one like an ace or a queen, and that's the money card, okay? Can everyone see? So this is the card that you want to keep track of, right? This is the money card. Now what the con artists will usually do is they'll mix them up. I can tell you're already confused. I'll show you again. There's the ace, there's the two, there's the three. And then they'll take the ace and they'll put it somewhere, usually on a table, but I'll just put it here. And then they'll say, where's the ace? Anyone have an idea? That's well, actually right here. You just lost 100 bucks, some clap. It's 100 bucks a game. All right, I'll do it again. You mix them up. See, the problem, it's hard to follow, right? Because I'm using three cards, and they all look the same. Now, they're big, so I can't palm them. But I'll help you out a little more. I'll raise this one up a little bit, oh, a little more. So you can actually see the ace is higher than the other two. So it'll be really easy to follow where the ace goes. Ever see me, everyone see me put the ace here? No, I really did. It's right here. Thank you. I got to be honest, I'm kind of lying to you. It's hard because there's three cards, and you will never be able to win your money back because, and by the way, it's $200, you all owe me now. Um, sometimes I pick up two cards when it looks like I'm picking up one. So it's very hard to see where the ace is so long as there's three cards there. That's why I'm going to make it even easier for you. Instead of using three cards, we're going to make it the two card Monty. Now watch close. See where I put the ace? It was right here all along. <laughs> Scans and cons are also a kind of magic, but they're done to rip people off. The three-card Monty, we don't see it so much anymore, but there was a time in American history where it was like the leading scam. Back in the mid to late 19th century,
con artists on the river boats in the Mississippi made what today would be 20 to 30 million dollars sometimes just doing the three card Monty and the shell game. In fact, the three card Monty and the shell game and these sort of primitive cons were the basis for the first organized crime syndicates in the United States, really the forerunners of the modern mob. Uh, my favorite story is about a Civil War courier by the name of Benjamin Marks who went up to Wyoming, I think, uh, to look for you know, people to con. And he found there were too many hustlers there. So he opened a store in which he put luxurious looking items priced at preposterous discounts. And he called it the dollar store. People would come in, lured by these luxury items in the windows, and then they would quickly direct them to the back of the room where there was a Monty game being played over a barrel. Everyone always lost their money, so no one ever actually bought anything. In the years to come, I guess they realized they could make as much money selling junk for next to nothing, and they went legit. And those are the ancestors of our modern dollar store, this great evolution in price point retail. But the Monty is more than just a silly con, it's really a form of theater. And I think it tells us a lot about why we're so easily fooled and why we want to believe things that are too good to be true. So a typical Monty game doesn't just involve one person like I just did. It usually involves like six to eight people, a crew of people. One's the operator, the person who's mixing the cards. I'm gonna hide it, you're gonna try and find it. You know, can't get paid off if you've been laid off. They have all these kinds of code words that they use to communicate with the rest of their crew. And then you have the couple guys looking out for the cops. And then you have the shills, the people who bet. But the shills do more than just bet and win to show the mark, the sucker, that you can win. It's actually very clever and choreographed. For instance, one of the shills will bet and win, but then another shill will bet and lose in a very stupid way. Pick the obvious wrong card so that the mark, the sucker, is like, oh, that was dumb, I could have won. But then it'll go even farther than that. The, another one of the shills will pretend to cheat. The operator, who usually pretends like he's blind or can't see very well or drunk, because the confidence person always wants to inspire, inspire false confidence. He'll look away for a second, maybe, or maybe the wind will blow over one of the cards, and then the shill who pretends to cheat will turn over one of the cards and revealing where the ace is. Then he'll bet and win. Now the, op, the mark is looking at this and saying, oh my gosh, like these guys are cheaters. Then the cheater will try and cheat again, but this time the, the operator will actually catch him cheating out of the corner of his eye. Then the cheating shill will look away for a second, momentarily distracted, and the operator will switch the cards without the cheater seeing it, and the cheater will bet and lose. So now the mark is seeing every angle and thinking, oh my gosh, there's no honor among thieves, this is a total scam, and I could totally beat these guys at their own game. Because the big myth about things like the three-card Monty is that people don't realize it's a scam, and that's why it works. That's not true. It works because people know it's a scam. It depends on people knowing it's a scam and then thinking they can write themselves into it. It hacks, it lockpicks that little avarice, that little kernel of greed that everyone has in them and gets us to think that we can win at this crooked game. And look at our political situation, look at the way we're sold you know, in advertising or, or wars are sold in Congress, look at how often we're told things that can't be true and yet we want to believe them, right? Why is that? Why is that? Well, I think these fundamental cons that I, I studied for my book and that I've studied on the streets of New York tell us a lot about the psychology that underlines everything from the Bernie Madoff's billion dollar Ponzi scheme to false election promises to the, to the weight loss gimmicks that we spend billions and billions and billions of dollars on to the psychic industry and to all these other things that, that we, and, and this is not to pass judgment, I've lost money on the Monty <laughs> because it's so convincing. You know, you think you can win. The truth is, you really can't. It's 0% chance. So if you ever see it, admire it for the art that it is. And, and it is kind of an art. I'm not trying to glorify these people because they are criminals, but there's a reason why con artists are the only criminals we call artists, right? It's one thing to hold someone up at gunpoint or, or I don't know, break into their home, but to get someone to willingly part with their money and not call the cops, maybe that takes a certain death touch. So I don't want to, you know, end on a negative note, but I do want to talk a little bit about um, why we like to believe. And there's another type of magic that is all about wanting to believe in things that may or may not be real. And that's called mentalism. How many people here have, have heard of this, have heard of mentalism? 
Yeah. There's that show, The Mentalist. Did anyone ever watch that? You, yeah. That was a good show, I think. I don't know. It was in California, right? He was a California guy. What I always thought was weird about The Mentalist is the cops never did anything. Like, they must have had the lowest self-esteem of any police department. They, they never solved a crime. It was, oh, the mentalist only was the only person who ever solved the crimes. The cops must have been like, man, we're terrible at this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so I'm going to show a little mentalism right now. And I, I need another volunteer, actually. Someone who, uh, you, young man, come up here. <laughs> so for those of you who may not know, mentalism is a, hi, what's your name? Jaden. Jaden from the, what's, what's it called? The forest and, uh, Zelda. oh, you're Zelda? Oh my, that's yeah. Zelda. That was my favorite game as a kid. And I, I can't tell you how happy it makes me that you like play Zelda, that that's been like rebooted, you know, like oh, yeah. I, Nintendo on like the Nintendo Super Entertainment System, I used to play that all the time. That's amazing. Gosh, <laughs> more things change, right? All right, well, Do you, do you remember that show where the guy got like the morning paper, the paper a day before? Did anyone remember that stupid show? I think so. Yeah, it was called like Morning Edition. Well, this is about what it might be like to predict the future. Mentalism is this, is this branch of magic that's all about like predicting the future and mind reading and psychics. Um, so I'm going to do a couple of things here to sort of talk about that. Uh, tell me how you spell your name again. Uh, J A D O N. Jaden, I want you to think of someone who's like close to you, but not right here, not here right now, like a relative or someone. And I just want you to print their name on this line right here. Okay? Just neatly print right there. There you go. Good. Doing a good job. Don't let me see it. You can fold it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. All right, we're just going to hold on that for a second. Then the other thing, uh, yes, good, thank you. The other thing I have here, is this a, is this a family member? Yes, I'm definitely getting a family vibe. Do you have siblings? Four. Well, three. I'm the fourth. Is this, is this a sibling? Yeah. It's one of your is sister, maybe? Mm -hmm. Can you hold this? Yeah. Did she have some news for you recently? Or did, did you see her today? I talked to her. You right? talked to her, and, and, her, and I'm getting a J. You talked to her on the phone. If, if she was here right now, you would say, hello, it's me, Jaden. Vanessa? Janessa? Janessa, is that your sister's name? Yeah. Wow, okay, amazing. <laughs> Janessa didn't have some news? Some, some, oh, anyway. She, I actually did just get a Snapchat. You got a Snapchat from her, okay, that must be why she was on your mind. Yeah. All right, well, that's, that's a little bit of a warm up, but this is a, this is a, a future predicting thing. I have this, this is from the New York Times yesterday Hong Kong bars activist from running for council, okay? This is a, a column from the newspaper. And in here, I've made a prediction, okay? In here, I've made a prediction about this newspaper column. Now, I want you to just say stop anywhere, and wherever you say stop, I'm going to cut it, okay? Wherever you say stop. stop. There for sure? Yes. You sure? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't want to go near it. You pick it up. And I want you to just read like the first like four or five words, three or four or five words on the, that you cut to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll start on the second line. The first one's like right now. Well, let me see. That's the, uh, that last word is, kind of. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Wherever, yeah. Okay. Um, as bus stops. No, no, no. Where you cut to? Right there. Oh, usually focused on local issues such as. Bus. Usually focused on local issues. Okay. And I didn't force you to cut there, right? You could have cut anywhere, and it was a long column. Yeah. Usually focused on local issues. Okay. Usually focused on local issues. Thanks, man. All right, thank you very much. Hop, what's the music from Zelda? What is it like? Dun, 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 dun. That's your walk-off music. <laughs> thank you. So mentalism is a branch of magic that incorporates spoon bending, mind reading, and there's also brilliant and beautiful psychological literature that goes along with it. Uh, it began in the 1950s with a scientist by the name of Bertram Four, and he did this experiment where he had his students fill out a personality uh, quiz. It was called the Diagnostic Interest Blank, you know? It was like a, you know, like a personality assessment. And he had them all fill them out, and then he gave them 
personality readings, you know, like character descriptions that were supposedly based on these personality descriptions or personality quizzes. And then he had them rate the accuracy of these readings on a scale of zero to five, with zero being like totally not accurate, this doesn't describe me at all, five being like, you nailed it, that's me exactly. And it turns out that the ratings was about 4.2. And they've done this experiment many times and it's always around 4.2. So it sounds like, it sounded like, this diagnostic interest blank was a pretty accurate, precise tool for gauging a person's personality. Turns out, though, he never used it. He threw them in the trash and gave everyone identical readings taken from a newsstand astrology book. Now, this experiment uh, has been repeated, like I said, many, many times. Uh, and this effect, it's called the Barnum effect, actually. Uh, not after um, there's a sucker born every minute, but actually after there's something for everyone. Our tendency to accept generic personality descriptions as uniquely our own is something that underlines horoscopes and psychics and all these kinds of things that uh, are a billion dollar industry uh, each year. Um, and, uh, and it tells us something very interesting about how our minds work how we want to believe. Now, this is a little different from magic, even though it is a kind of magic, because it's not so much about being fooled, it's about being understood. And we all want to believe that we can be understood, that, that, that there's something out there, that there's something true to, that, that, you know, to the universe, that we're not alone. Uh, they've done a very interesting corollary to this, for, to this Bertram Four experiment, for instance, in which they had people talk to a mock astro astrologer, and they divided people into three groups. And one group, gave the astrologer like the exact date, day, month, and year of their birth. Another group gave like just the month of their birth, and then the third group gave no information. And then the astrologer gave them all identical readings. And then they had them rank how accurate they found the readings to be. And here's the crazy thing. The people that had given no information ranked the accuracy in like the mid to high threes, 3.6, 3.7. People that had given just the month of their year ranked them higher, closer to a four. And the people that had given the exact day, month, and year of their birth ranked it, the accuracy of the reading, like a 4.3, even though they were all told the same things, which suggests that the perceived accuracy of the reading was not a function of what the astrologer told the people, but of what they told the astrologer. Now, this is a phenomenon that magicians exploit and psychics exploit, and, um, and I think it's also a very fascinating example of why we want to believe and how we believe things, and there's a wealth of psychological and cognitive biases at work. The confirmation bias, for instance, the way we remember things that are true or that tend to elicit an emotional response and selectively forget things that don't. There's um, using generic statements, body language, suggestion. These are all forms of magic, right? But you might not think about them as magic when you go to a psychic reading or you read your horoscope. It's the same psychological conditioning. It's the same tricks at play. The mind wants to believe, and perception is reality. Seeing is not believing. Thinking is believing. I have these two spoons, for instance, right? Um, can you just uh, come up here for a second? Just tell, just, this, do you look solid to you? Yeah, they feel solid. Which one do you want me to use? This one. Okay, this one. So this one's going to be the control, guys, this one here, okay? Watch carefully. I'm going to bend the spoon. Try to do it a little more. I'm getting faint. <laughs> People have made millions of dollars. Yuri Gellers, the spoon benders. A, a, a group actually fooled scientists during this. You, uh, this uh, the magician by the name of Benacek. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he fooled these physicists actually using these techniques in a controlled lab setting. Some people think I have a very strong hand, but actually just watch. I'm not even going to touch it. Just watch the, bell, the, the bowl of the spoon. Watch right here, okay? Thank you. Thank you. 
The real thing is the spoons were actually never bent. It was all just an illusion. <laughs> Fooling people is fun. It's why most of us became magicians. Uh, the psychologist Ekman, uh, Eric Ekman, I think, he called it duping delight, actually. Duping delight is the pleasure that we all get from putting one over on someone else. And let's face it, right? We've all told a little lie here and there and thought, oh, that's kind of cool, right? He said there's three factors that influence how much fun it is to fool someone else. Uh, the size of the lie, how difficult it was to pull it off, and how much we get from it, either in terms of praise or rewards or money or whatnot. Now, magicians have made this into a sporting event with these contests in the Magic Olympics, where the great magicians of the world gather together and try to fool each other, right? The hardest audience in the world to fool, these big, elaborate illusions, and then, of course, prize money and the respect and admiration of their peers. But it's also fun to be fooled, right? And that's ultimately why I like magic and why I'm so interested in the psychology of magic, because it really does tell us something about what it means to be human, right? There's something very beautiful, I think, about the fact that we can be fooled in this elaborate, technologically saturated age by a card trick and a coin. And that's because magic exploits these perceptual mechanisms that are really hardwired into our brain from our evolutionary past. Um, can I get one more volunteer? Uh, yeah, would you mind coming up here? Everyone give her a hand. What's your name? Sammy. Sammy, everyone, Sammy. <laughs> Sammy, take this pen. Now, we're going to do a card trick, but I can see the card because it's not one of those pick a card, find a card. So any card you want, just take anyone out. So, I'm going to have you write your name on it, that's why. Um, Which one would you like? Anyone you like, doesn't matter. Just one to two of clubs. All right, Sammy, and if you would just write in big letters, write your name on top on it. Here, you want to sit down? You can sit down, here. Sit. Get yourself, make yourself comfortable. Pull up a chair. Have a scotch. <laughs> so fooling people is fun, but being fooled is really fun. And why is it fun? Because it's, I think, a controlled way to experience a loss of control. Kind of like riding a roller coaster, seeing a scary movie, right? Oh, that's great. Sammy, everyone. This is Sammy's card, okay? Now, I might have more than, that's your card, right? Yes. I might have more than one two of clubs, but I certainly don't have more than one two of clubs with Sammy's signature on it, right? Now, what I'm about to show you is known as the trick to fool Houdini. And that's where I got the title of my book, Fooling Houdini. So Houdini, at the height of his powers, had this famous boast. He said, I can figure out any trick in the world if I see it done three times in a row. Because magic relies on misdirection and surprise, and sometimes it doesn't work if you keep doing it. Once is a trick, twice is a lesson, as the saying goes. So for years, Sammy, Houdini's boast went unmet. And then one day, at a dinner in Houdini's honor at the Great Northern Hotel in Chicago, a relatively unknown Canadian magician by the name of Di Vernon did a version of the ambitious card routine where a card that is signed is placed in the middle of the deck. Can you pick up about half the cards? Yeah, perfect. Put them on top of your card. Yep. And after a magical gesture, you just do like a snap or abric yeah, that, yeah, that's good, that's good, that's good. The card rises to the top. I know, it's weird, right? Yes. Now, according to the legend, Di Vernon did this multiple times. Now, it's not on the bottom, it's not on the top. I can even shuffle the cards a little bit, okay? okay? But as soon as I, this is actually a, a phenomenon from quantum physics. Have you heard of quantum tunneling? I just do the move like this, and the card jumps back up again. According to the legend, Di Vernon did this trick. That's your card, right? I can't fake that. Here, I'll let you, here, I'll tell you what, I'll let you push it in, okay? Here, you push it in. <laughs> According to the, <laughs> she wants to go, she's like, I'm not done with this. This guy's weird. <laughs> According to the legend, Di Vernon did this trick eight times before Houdini walked out in defeat. And ever since that day, he was known as the man who fooled Houdini. Oh. 
He went on to become one of the great sleight of hand masters of the 20th century. Not that well known among lay people, but among magicians, he's like the Einstein of card tricks. Now, he lived to a very, I think he lived to his mid-90s, very advanced age. He was very successful, admired by his peers. By the way, sometimes what gamblers and hustlers will do is they'll put a bend in the card. That way you can see it from the back as well as the front. So Di Vernon was asked, you've had this wonderful life. Is there anything you still wish for before you die? And he said, I wish that someone could fool me one more time. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed coming here. Thank you so much. I'm Alex Stone. We'll be out there signing some books. Please feel free to come, ask questions. Email me, alex at foolinghoudini.com if you want to know anything more about magic or if you're interested in magic. And I really appreciate your time. And have a wonderful day and happy Halloween! Yeah.